So I, I'd like to introduce to you um, our panel today. Um, the main topic is understanding the role that telcos will play in this API economy and uh, in business communications. Um, so I'd like to start um, um, on the left side of, of uh, my left side with an, uh, Anushka Tiklik. Uh, she is uh, working with uh, KPN Open Innovation Hub, and I would like to ask you to do just a quick introduction of what this means. Yes, I'm working within the KPN Open Innovation Hub. It's a separate unit within KPN where we start new initiatives and experiments, and if it grows bigger, we bring it back uh, to the business. I'm responsible for our platform business models, and that includes uh, the API store. Thank you. And we also have uh, Marioka. She is the founding pa partner at Osango Oi. Can you just give us a quick explanation of what you do? Hi, or moi, as we say in Finland. Um, some of you might have learned this today. Um, I'm an API economy and API architect uh, trainer, consultant, and also the author of uh, API Economy 101 book. Um, and I'm here, I think, because I've also got myself mixed up with some telco and some CPAS, let's talk about that term later, uh, <laughs> vendors and, and uh, customer cases. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And we have uh, Bahadir from uh, Proximus. Can you tell us just quickly what you've done in CPAS? Yes. Uh, what, what we have done in CPAS is, um, in maybe a few words, um, we started about five years ago that uh, we had to change. So we had to uh, adapt to what the customers were expecting from us, which was uh, opening up our, our assets. Um, and we decided that we could not be everything to everyone. So uh, we said we are going to just focus on a couple of um, vertical, or sorry, horizontal solutions. And we developed just a few uh, key solutions, and that's a key word. Uh, we didn't really focus on the building blocks. That was difficult. But we said we have to offer solutions to, to our customers. We developed uh, SMS A2P. We focused on uh, also IoT and, and data analytics. So it's not pure. CPaaS, as we yeah. think of it, but we found a few key solutions like uh, real-time analytics, which was leveraging our networks. And uh, I'm happy to say that our SMS A2P business is growing very well, so it's, it's a very healthy business. And we are now seeing also good traction for the other solutions like voice APIs. Requests are coming in from the, I would call the pioneer customers. Thank you. And next, we have Frank Malka from JPU. Can you just give us a brief intro about JPU? Yes, we are uh, providing APIs for uh, the mobility world. So we are enabling uh, enterprises to configure their mobility plans, their connectivity, and their mobile devices using APIs uh, on top of the public network and create some kind of virtual uh, network they can protect. Thank you. So uh, there are some questions that I prepared uh, for, for our, our panelists, and we discussed a little bit beforehand. So the, the first question that I'd like to start, and maybe uh, if I can begin with Mariuka, um, what can you tell us? What is your assessment in terms of the current status of telcos? CPAS, there's always a question of whether telcos have been slow to the game, whether Twilio has been around for 10 years, are they eating their lunch? What is your take on that question? Well, the question, I think, is what is the game? Uh, because, like you said, <laughs> uh, there are a lot of things that telcos can do. It's actually very hard to say what is a telco, because they are basically supermarkets and wholesalers and tailors and all kinds of things. And um, I think that if you talk about API economy or like APIs, um, then a lot of the telcos have actually been there all, a, a long time if you count all the SOAP stuff and, and kind of legacy APIs. But I think that's also the problem because they have had a working thing. Why change it? But now that they are con consistently going into um, this customer experience and digital services and more into the kind of retail space in the whole, you can buy almost everything now, like candy almost, in, in the telco yeah. stores. So um, they have to go 
into the newer uh, evolution of APIs, and that brings the problems. They have the very, very new stuff, and they, then they have the legacy platforms, and they have to keep still the networking and the kind of the telephony part of things working, and, and that's a huge thing. So, um, yeah, I think that the C parses are just as a very short answer, but they are in a place where it's a more of a green field. They can just leverage the stuff that the telcos have already done, but then build the whole new stack there and, and the whole new way of customer service and be there for the builders, not necessarily developers, but builders of other solutions. Yeah, I could say um, that from my experience, I think I do agree it's a greenfield opportunity, and I think that telcos are actually uh, emerging right now uh, and, and going into a new stage for what we have been calling CPAS. So I, I personally think there's a natural evolution. One thing that I found very interesting about what KPM and, and, and Proximus have done is um, you seem to have moved very fast, which is extremely hard in a telco environment, and I could say unusual, particularly considering that, that both telcos are actually the, the largest in their respective countries. So um, I know that you handle this project with uh, certain considerations, so I could like to ask our two guests, maybe starting with Anushka, how were you able to pull this together in such a short period of time? Yeah, um, because we started very small. Um, so we started with the API store as a, a really test it in the market. And what we already saw, and I think that had to do with timing as well, that our clients were really asking for services through APIs. Yeah. So I think we passed the discussion a little bit already if we had to do it, yes or no, but it's more how we were going to do it. Yeah. Uh, and we really approached it from a marketplace store perspective. Uh, which means we took the approach that we don't do it completely ourselves, yeah. uh, but that we work with partners in that sense. Um, and I think that really helped us to uh, gain speed. Um, and we didn't build a big thing, right? So we started with a small thing and, and tested, and then we officially launched uh, April this year, uh, while before they're doing several iterations to build a platform and to make it more uh, sustainable and scalable. And the, the fact that we have uh, different propositions from KPN and other partners, and a lot of them are here because we work with the bigger ones and the smaller ones, um, I think that really, uh, for us, gives us a place in the ecosystem as well. So, so just to give context before we get to the next speaker, can you share with the audience um, from the uh, initial stage until you launched that first iteration, like how yeah. much time we're talking about? Yeah, it took us uh, four months to uh, launch the MVP. Um, and then it took us uh, a year to do the full launch. And mm -hmm. in the MVP, we had three APIs. <laughs> And then we really started with working with use case and bigger, bigger clients, uh, like KLM, for example, as an uh, airline company, yeah. to really uh, learn and uh, develop it further. So, so you, uh, again, to clarify, uh, this was like an initial prototype, but it was in production. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Mariuka, you wanted to add? Yeah, I just had a couple of comments. I, I think that this really good uh, way of starting with a really small thing and testing it, that's what I teach. Uh, but also uh, that it's really important to be in the game because I was working with a big retailer and we were building digital systems and, and we needed transactional emails, messages, uh, yeah. phone calls and everything else. And we, there was an, already an agreement with a Nordic telecom provider with all of that, but we couldn't use them because they didn't have APIs and it was like non-functional situation. Um, so yeah, I think very good. But uh, I asked this also from the, the Nordic telcos that uh, before I came here, who I'm working with them, they said they go with the partner strategy. So it's also interesting that you are like building it yourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're combining the partners and our own uh, uh, products in that sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you share uh, what you were doing? You also had a, a relatively short time to market from when you started to when you launched. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, but um, actually we started some time ago. I, mean, I was in the strategy department and we were thinking already five years ago, how can we open up our assets via APIs? Um, so, um, and I will talk a little bit about the, 
maybe the good things and the, and, and the pain points that we, we lived through. Um, we decided to also incubate, in fact, as a startup, uh, what we call the enabling company. We said we have to do this. Uh, we don't want to be um, slowed down, actually, by the, by, the, by the bigger company, bigger organization. So we decided to create Enco.io, so that's in short for uh, enabling company. And um, as you said, we chose a number of trustable partners especially for IT, for our API management platform, and, and we quickly built, in fact, a number of uh, greenfield solutions. And that was really good, actually, to quickly bring uh, our partners, and I cannot emphasize enough, you really have to have, I think, good, good partners to help you go to the market, to explain the value proposition to the customers, because you're not top of mind for many of those. They will indeed go to Twilio or to, to somebody else, but you also offer something that is as good, perhaps even uh, more relevant to them because you're local to the market. So um, we went with our SMS A2, A2, A2P solution with our partners. Uh, we are also working at other solutions. Um, that was a good thing because we could indeed relatively in, the, in uh, less than 12 months, one year, develop solutions. As I mentioned, we have multiple solutions like SMS, like uh, real-time analytics for uh, uh, IoT, MyThings, that is leveraging also the network. But what we uh, realize afterwards is that when you create a startup and you want to scale up, then it becomes a big challenge because you want to develop some brownfield solutions. You want to really, or your customers come to you and they say, look, I have a use case and I want you to help me because uh, you're already helping me in that context, for example, customer engagement. And then you start, sort of start seeing the, the, the big challenge that you have to start using your governance process. You have to start using your, your, your security, your identity management that you're already uh, using for your other products. And that was, I think, for us, the, the next level of challenge that we have, to, we have to solve. Thank you. So there's some really interesting elements that I see coming together here. So you have the, the telcos that have a, a real estate in terms of, of, the, of the market, not just the consumer, but, but also enterprise. And you, you're bringing up, I think, two components that kind of uh, make an interesting mix. You're talking about the business model with the marketplace, and you're also talking about your partnerships. And, and we have here also on, on the panel one, one uh, uh, a different business model, but from the perspective of, of, the, of, of the partnership. Can you tell us a little bit about what your experience has been uh, with this uh, business model uh, for the marketplace? Yes, so, so for us, I mean, as a startup, we are uh, bringing, or trying to bring innovation and uh, uh, in a world which is uh, very uh, strict and closed. So, so opportunities like uh, stores which rely on uh, a big network uh, are a great platform for us to expose our capabilities uh, to, to the enterprise, okay? So what, what we did, in, in fact, the concept of our platform is uh, providing uh, a network slice. So network slice is a 5G concept on the mobile network, uh, which allows to segregate the network in uh, small pieces. And, and you can imagine that each one of these pieces could be assigned to an enterprise with APIs, and then this enterprise could have full control of this piece. And, and we are doing this uh, on 4G and 3G as well. Uh, and, and for us, without these uh, telcos opening the doors to new technologies, mm -hmm. it would be a challenge to get into the market. Thank you. So, um, can, can you give us an idea uh, if, if it's possible for you to share some of the names of your partners? And I know that the value chain can be complex, but can you share who you're partnering with on the technology side, but also on what is actually on the marketplace? Yeah, yeah we, um, we partner with uh, Apigee for our API management uh, platform. Um, and the partners that in our store are also with their name in the uh, API store. So developer.kpn.com provides you the, the marketplace. So we just uh, welcome GPU, for example. Mm. Uh, but also uh, VoIP, for example, Ribbon, Nexmo. Um, but also smaller uh, Dutch company like Contexta, who's doing speech-to-text. 
and AI uh, really focus on the Dutch language. So we are really looking at bigger and smaller companies and there has to be a match in the partnership, right? So we have to bring value to the partner and the partner has to bring value to our clients. And that can be a company that doesn't want to build their own footprint in the local market or a smaller company that doesn't want to do the distribution themselves. Um, and for us, it also brings a um, added value to the current KPN portfolio because I think it's a new way of going to market. But also, if you look at some of our clients who already uh, have a call center solution but want to add functionality, then this is a good way to uh, to add it through APIs from the uh, from the API store, for example. Thank you. And the same question: Can you share some of the names of your partners? Yeah. Uh, first, maybe I want to emphasize one thing that we our approaches are a bit different. <laughs> so uh, you are working with a lot of, I think, external partners. Um, for whatever reason, we didn't de we decided not to do that yet. So I think we will probably probably look into that, and that's one of the reasons why we are here. Um, for uh, for the technology partnership, uh, we use a local player uh, for for the development. We used for the API management platform WSO2. We're very happy with it. Um, and then we have a number of affiliates that we acquired for the, to build the front end. Yeah. So if I may drop a name, it's Umbrace. It's a very small company, but they, I mean they they really helped us build a very I think attractive front end to to attract the developers because that was also initially the target to, to approach the developers. That's a bit the, the technology part for partnerships. Um, maybe one or two names. A ring Ring Ring. I don't know how many people know that, but uh, it's a it's a small Belgian company, and they're really focused on actually connecting customers for uh, for A 2 P. SMS messaging, and there we really saw a big, uh, uh, I think, co uh, complementarity between the two firms, that they had the reach, they could get to the customer, explain the value proposition, and we had the capability to deliver on the promise to make sure that there was business continuity, the quality was there, everything that they expected uh, from us that we could, we could deliver. Thank you. So, uh, just one more question for, for both of you, uh, uh, quickly. Um, can you share with us uh, what do you think has been very successful? Where do you see this model gaining traction? You mentioned some um, applications that are for customer engagement, but I'm sure you have other examples. Yeah, well, we started, uh, well, obviously, escaping on the communication side. Uh, so that's SMS, uh, voice, video, um, and we, in that sense, we follow also the, the KPM portfolio, uh, but we see a lot of traction also in certain verticals, like health, for example. Mm. Uh, to bring down the cost in health, you see more and more uh, hospitals going to video calling, for example. So we've also got one case with a uh, software development company uh, where they use our video solution, where patients can do a video call uh, with their doctors. Of course, security is very important in that mm -hmm. sense. But then as a next step, you also see that identity becomes very important because if you are doing digital communication, identity becomes uh, a very important, especially in the healthcare. So we see then that it's moving to, to different categories where people start having additional questions and looking for uh, additional solutions. Mm -hmm. Same question. Yeah. Um, I, I think Anushka is completely correct. Um, a few years ago, uh, we acquired Telesign, actually. So it's, uh, well, it belongs to the Proximus Group. Um, I think it's one of the key things about uh, when you mentioned identity management. Uh, 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 Telesign is one of the key value propositions, actually, is, uh, is identity management. For us, um, I would say customer engagement, but we try to take a more holistic approach. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, there is CPaaS, definitely customers uh, need from us uh, a solution that will fit their use cases. But um, I think we need to look at it also from a telco perspective a little bit broader. In the sense that uh, we have a voice solution, we have an SMS solution, we have an email solution, because the customers, our customer, which is the enterprise, they are looking for an uh, a, a holistic approach, a 24-7 approach, if I may call it. So they say, okay, I need whatever channel that the customer wants to reach me. I, as a telco, I need you to help me enable this. 
So whether it's an API, they don't really care. In fact, they think about the use case, the pain point that they have. Um, having said that, I think we have some uh, uh, mature solutions in, in place in the cloud. For example, we have a, a customer engagement solution that's purely working on voice. We have a product called Hashtag Interact, which is aggregating different OTT messaging platforms. So we use also, a, not, we don't really sell APIs. We just integrate the APIs and we try to bring the solution, integrate the solution. I think the next stage will be artificial intelligence. Uh, I think that uh, speech to text and uh, natural language understanding will probably play a very important role in customer engagement. And just maybe a last point, we try to work also with what we call smart concepts, like smart buildings, mm. uh, smart cities, uh, smart venues. And when you go with a kind of uh, explanation, uh, a solution to the customer saying that, okay, I can make your business smarter, I can help you work more, more efficiently. I think that also works better than just trying to say, okay, we have a point solution here, a product. And I think it's better to, uh, it uh, resonates with the customers. Thank you. So I, I could like now maybe to shift the topic a little bit and ask for uh, Mariuka and Frank. Uh, in terms of your experience with, with telcos, there's always challenges. So uh, what would be your recommendations from, from, from your perspective as uh, part of the marketplace in terms of um, how more telcos can benefit from this business model? Uh, what are some of the challenges that, that you think they can anticipate so that they can be successful with this model? Frank. Yes. Yeah, okay. Please. So I think uh, the big challenge for the telco is uh, to become open and flexible, and 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 we are uh, uh, the kind of company that can enable them uh, to do that uh, and make uh, new business models happen, new verticals uh, supported, um, and and sometimes without disrupting the network, which is, uh, and changing the, the approach where, where most of the telco model is consumer-centric and, and uh, innovative or innovation and creative stuff like a smaller company brings, uh, create new models and uh, new opportunities. And, uh, and uh, I, 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 it's, I see it happening. Sometimes it's happening in the telco itself, and sometimes the telco understands that its, uh, its cost structure cannot embrace it. And, and then we are seeing also uh, telcos across the world starting uh, external MVNOs for specific markets to be more disruptive, more dynamic, and, and, and uh, uh, I think those small MVNOs focusing on vertical are, are, are uh, the next generation telco. It, it will become uh, more distributed, uh, a more specific per use case. Uh, you already mentioned it that you are find uh, the way for, to health care or the way to, to provide solution to specific verticals. So I think the, the future of the telco is to dispatch too many small structures and, and, and support different business case, cases in a very uh, disruptive way or mm. flexible. Agility is the key. So, Marioka, you've seen a lot of experiences. Yeah. So, what could be your recommendations for the telcos? I would say that stick with what you are really good at, first of all. Like uh, mentioned here was healthcare and security and identity and, and, and a lot of things that the traditional telcos are really good, like brand-wise. I mean, there are also very good other companies, but brand-wise, everybody tends to trust telco because that's what they have been doing all the time. And um, also, telcos are kind of uh, globally local. so. There is always that local network mm -hmm. operator, the local companies. They might be working in other countries too. They might be partnering. Uh, like I was just talking with Telia, one of the, the Nordics um, operators, and they are making a partnership with AT&T. And um, I think that that's kind of the, the strength of them. So they have local presence, uh, but then uh, if 
like you were saying about the kind of omnichannel three, I would call it 360, not 24 <laughs> uh, communication. So, <laughs> so I mean, like email, SMSs, video, audio, everything, um, and and also while working with uh, um, some US-based uh, speech-to-text uh, companies. So one of those uh, is a very good uh, add-on to the service. But what I would want to see is that. Um, I don't care kind of like who's providing the channels to communicate with the customer. I just want to get my message through and I want it to go through with the suitable method for that person or that recipient uh, in the, like given the context that they are in. Like I was using the KLM um, flight uh, airline while coming here and they had this check these boxes, what channels you want your flight information to come through. And there were a lot of boxes. There are a lot of different channels uh, from, from WeChat to everything else. And I really like that. But on the other hand, I don't care. I just want it to be coming in with the messaging platform that is useful for me in the context of traveling. Um, so I would kind of see it so that um, the telcos could be the local customer interface to the CPAS and whatever <laughs> platforms yeah. that handle the, the contextual communication or like put the context to the communication and handle all these channels. Mm -hmm. And some of the channels can be owned and operated by the telcos themselves, but kind of like how they are combined together. And then coming into the um, kind of consultancies and, and all kinds of software providers who then provide the solutions to that specific industry. So like maybe mm. the telcos shouldn't do all of it themselves. Mm. So I, that's really interesting and I think it brings us back to the marketplace business mm. model which, which seems to be at least for these initial uh, early deployments what, what uh, seems to be a, a, an ideal solution. Do, do, and I could like to ask the, the entire uh, panel uh, your, your opinion. Does the um, API marketplace for telcos, do you see that as a way forward or are there other alternatives that you might consider eventually? Maybe Anushka. Yeah, I, I think um, what we did, we brought it a bit further than the marketplace because we thought that was not a, uh, enough fitting our clients' requirements. So um, if you have the different APIs, you in the end get one invoice. So we do the billing and the invoicing, the first line support. As a developer, there's a one-time registration, for example. So that's really catered for the enterprise market. So we mm -hmm. wanted to add value on that side. Um, so that goes a bit further, I think, than just bringing the buyer and uh, seller together. And I think there are also successful models uh, like that in place as well. But that's not the model that, uh, that we chose. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a question of are you in the platform economy business model uh, where you use just everybody else's resources and get them together or are you the reseller? But I can't emphasize more the value of invoicing <laughs> because yeah. uh, in the retails and in, in insurance companies and other companies, for example, in Finland, the one problem has been with all of these microservices and API economy that uh, the managers run out of credit uh, with their credit cards yeah. <laughs> and then the whole digital service uh, framework is stopped. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's one thing. But I also see uh, examples, for example, from content streaming that um, there are these, these uh, platforms of platforms. So basically, somebody else comes in and makes uh, an API uh, uh, providing platform that combines several different telcos or content providers or logistics providers. So that is one business model that you should be all aware of because that will probably happen. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I would look at three things. Uh, the first thing I think is uh, when you're designing a marketplace, you have to know your customers. So what is the consumption model that uh, your customer is going to come to you and who will be your customer? Now, um, our experience is that we build something for developers, but Belgium is not a very large country. We don't have a huge amount of, of, of developers. Um, as I also said in, uh, previously, uh, we also uh, were working in a startup mentality. We were not even using our own brand. Uh, you didn't go to Proximus.com to, to look at our uh, CPaaS uh, or other solutions. You, go, you went to another website. 
So I think the, the second one is leverage your brand, leverage your internal capabilities, your sales channels, your partner channels as, as much as possible. And the third one, I think, is a digital journey. So the, how you're going to onboard the, the customers, the frictionless, in fact, onboarding, how easy it is for them to quickly come and take the service, buy the, buy the service. But don't also forget that, at least for us, you are working with large enterprises, they have procurement departments, they have different decision makers. So you have to make sure that you can cover those, uh, those different um, buyers uh, with, your, with your solutions. Maybe the, the developer will come to your, um, your marketplace, but he may not be the one who's making the, or who's clicking on the buy. So you have to make sure that you can invoice it correctly, you can use or offer them different channels, not only your marketplace, but different entry points. And I insist that they all be digital so that they can quickly move them and, and consume the service and can be invoiced. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Frank, what do you think of the uh, marketplace business model? Is this something that for you represents value, something you could like to move forward with? So it is, it is a platform that, that has a value, but, but at the end it needs, it needs to remain open. I mean, I, I, I like the idea of getting one bill, but I can't like the idea of getting uh, all the services from one place, because okay. uh, I always want to be more open. I want to consume more services. I consume infrastructure in AWS and maybe in Azure, and maybe in other marketplace. So I want to choose whatever marketplace I want to consume services to remain open. So I, I, as, as a developer, I wouldn't want to get everything from one place. I want as many if I want, uh, if I need, and I would even prefer to combine services uh, and even to use twice uh, or two different services that give me the same capabilities just to give me uh, flexibility or, or redundancy, or maybe uh, in case of there is a commercial issue with one, I still can work with the other one, right? So I, I still want to have the, cho the choice, and as many marketplaces there are, then I have more choice, and that, that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. great. Thank you. So we have about eight minutes, and I'd like to open now for any questions that we may have for, for the audience. Um, so please raise your hand if you have any questions. Otherwise, I, I still have more questions. Um, any, any questions? Nope, not yet. Okay, so just raise your hand if there's any questions from the audience. And I'd like then just to uh, think right now about the, the challenges. Um, if you uh, were to meet uh, another telco that was just considering in the initial stages of planning uh, something similar to what you have done, what could be like the key recommendations that you could say, be careful with this or make sure you uh, consider this? Anushka. Um, well, I think it's, you know, putting the small thing together um, is not the, the biggest challenge, but in the end you want to integrate it with the current business and portfolio. Um, and that means you also have to link to processes and the billing systems and the customer support systems around it that are already used because that's the way to, uh, in the end, be also be able to scale it up and bring it to all your clients uh, in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because then the, the new world is coming together with the running world and the legacy, um, it takes some time and effort to get all people together and, and the second thing is we really approach API as a product and that's something we really had to get across the organization to make sure uh, people understand that and to show the value and convince them of that. But So that are the two things I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you have any comments yeah, on that? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't agree more, except a couple of things I want to kind of elaborate. Um, I, I'm seeing, luckily, the Finnish telcos embracing uh, API cycles, the method I was creating, and that's essentially what you are doing in a way that API is, is handled as a productized 
service, uh, not necessarily as a product, it can be, but, but uh, otherwise. And there is a strict value proposition there, and there are all the people involved. But the thing is that with telcos, there is a lot of um, customer-specific implementations, and uh, I'm seeing in the Nordic telcos that they are experimenting a lot with things. They are experimenting with like uh, industry solutions with 5G, they're experimenting by putting streaming devices and networks in a car and in a football field and a lot of other things that actually demand their own APIs. And so I would be a bit careful on the kind of treat everything as a unified product, like serve everybody the same product. Maybe not so, but if you do APIs, you should be very careful in the product management that you uh, identify exactly what is a unified, unique, you know, like uh, one product served like that for everybody, but what is then also a kind of customized solutions which is still worth making. And for the API management vendors and consultants, be aware that, aware that the, the telcos have tons of APIs and the solutions are going to run out of memory and <laughs> it's, it's a trap. Yeah. Thank you. So there's a question from the audience. Mark, can you yeah, please thanks. go ahead? Um, yeah, it's a really interesting discussion and, and I, I'm wondering for the, the, the two um, carriers here, KPN and Proximus, if there's any, um, what you've described and I think where you both sit in the organization is around these commercial offers, right, of APIs either through marketplace grocery stores or opening up APIs for SMS or voice, et cetera. Um, but there's a, a lot of um, development in network operations and IT architectures that's moving you know, the, the entire environment, all those domains to microservices and APIs. And in fact, that's probably a richer, more innovative set of activities than what you're doing on the commercial side. And I'm just wondering, to what extent are you combining those efforts and those learnings and investments um, and, um, you know, leveraging that? Does that make sense at all to you? It does? Well, do you want me to go first? <laughs> okay. No, yeah, absolutely spot on. Um, indeed, when uh, we, and maybe I'll disclose a little bit of our thinking. Um, I think we need to follow two tracks. So the first track that we follow is the partner track, where we have ready-made, in fact, API solutions uh, available from our partners. But we did an analysis, and in fact, the guy who did, who did the analysis sitting there, our, in fact, uh, architect uh, at Proximus, um, and we looked at our available APIs for voice. We looked at our existing platforms, and we were absolutely blown away by the number of APIs. And I talk about uh, a number, not really the ready-made solutions. But you have more than 100 APIs in multiple platforms that you can expose and you can offer it actually as a solution to the, to the market. But then we also realize the challenge that these are not really product APIs, they are just APIs to make the internal communication, the billing and then the provisioning, et cetera, to make it, make it easier. So yes, we want to expose them, but then I think we will have to go through a much longer development cycle, as Anushka mentioned. I mean, you have to take care of billing, you have to take care of um, security, you have to take care of exposing an, an API to, with, that wasn't designed initially with that, with that mindset. So I think it's a bit of a challenge to, um, to, to expose those. It will take a bit of time, but I think probably at the end we will have a much richer set of uh, features or, 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 or solutions that we can, we can bring to the market than we realize. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, we, we're uh, almost at, yes, is that a question? Yes, please. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a question. So with Proximus and KPN, right, neighboring countries both exposing their assets through APIs, um, I'm thinking back of what uh, some of the presentation of yesterday, um, APIs as asset exposure or APIs as a value proposition, there's a, there's a gap somewhere between that, right? Um, and the, thinking back of, of, to Jose's presentation yesterday about, let's say, the concept of a platform. It would be great if an application that was developed in the Netherlands on top of the KPN telco APIs would actually work also when you drive across the border into Belgium. Because that's the proposition basically of Twilio, right? It's a global thing, you write it once, it works globally. So if you combine the two worlds, 
of the security, local, global, telco value proposition with the ability to use it across different telcos, I think it would be, it would be a great value proposition. So what are your views as KPN and Proximus on that sort of collaboration on such an, let's say, an open telco API? That's something we are, we are looking at. Um, we also discussed, for example, uh, blockchain as a service solutions and something how we can uh, do that across the border and uh, work together. Um, so and I think you can do that with telcos and also with other parties. Um, but I think especially if you're not in the same market, it's a very good way to, uh, to do that. Oh, I think we are already doing part of that. So we have the roaming. Uh, and, and I don't talk about the roaming of the the typical mobile network, but we have what we call the LoRa network, uh, the low power. Huh? And actually, <laughs> we met a few people from KPN uh, previous years, uh, and, and we are actually completely, uh, if you take, buy a service, in fact, from KPN, and you bring that service to, to Belgium, it will continue to work because we have a roaming agreement. But broader, I think you need to have a kind of uh, open, open standard where the service that you start using from KPN or for Proximus needs to be sort of cross-border compatible with, uh, with each other. Um, I can give you one more service example, which is RCS. I think uh, RCS is going to be also uh, fitting, that, uh, fitting that description. But for the more propriety services, we have to get together and we have to, I think, uh, that's my takeaway at least, so maybe I'm going a little bit uh, over time, but um, I didn't see more telcos. I, I wish that we could sit together also with uh, other telcos uh, from, from the Benelux and say, okay, let's sit around the table and try to come up with some standards that we can offer to our customers. That, because I, I fully agree with you. That's a very, I think, key value proposition to tell to customers. It will work across uh, uh, any operator. It doesn't matter from where you buy. Well, thank you. We, um, as you say, we're, we're over time, so I'd just like to very quickly thank our panelists. Uh, this is a, a, a very interesting experiment. It's still very new, so thank you for sharing your, your experience and Mariuka for your, for your uh, knowledge in, in the field. Thank you very much. Thank you.